folks. So I've been thinking a lot about um, how God puts things together even when we're not expecting it. I talked to mom about it last night a little bit, and I think I talked to dad about it on Friday night a little bit. Um, but it's just so neat because you would think that we confer together and discuss what our messages are going to be about and what scriptures we're going to use, and it just isn't that way. I only know the general subject of mom's message that she's planning for next Friday, and I had no idea what dad was going to be speaking on on Friday night, yet somehow my message ties both of them together, both in some subject matter as well as some scriptures. There was no conferring between my parents and I on what this, this message should be or what scriptures should be used, but Holy Spirit put it together, and he's taking us on a journey. Before I get into it, um, I just want to, us to lift up our voices in prayer. I want to invite the Holy Spirit to come. I mean, He's already here, but I want to invite Him to, to, to come down in, in our hearts and to awaken our, our hearts to receive His Word. Yes. So will you lift your voices with me? Holy Spirit, I call out to you right now and I ask you to come into this place and come into my heart. Let your anointing fall upon this house tonight, Lord, to this morning, Lord, and let your anointing fall upon me as I bring forth your word. Lord God, I pray that you would open the hearts and the minds of every individual who is hearing this message. And I thank you, Lord, for your word and the truth of your word. I thank you for the hidden things in your word that you reveal to us in times of need. I ask you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would flow through this place from heart to heart, mind to mind, that we would be changed, as Mom said earlier, from glory to glory. Lord, change us, change our hearts, change our minds. Raise us up to be a mighty, mighty warrior. In Jesus' name. This message today, it's going to be kind of half teaching and half preaching. And I guess that makes sense since I'm half mom and half dad. So I'm going to ask you to pay attention, listen, follow along, and really be patient. Because... I'm going somewhere with this, and at first it may not make any sense where I'm going. Last time I preached, I was talking about taking ownership of power, of the gifts, of, of the promises of God. But he didn't let me stop there. As soon as I was done preaching, I knew there was more. And even while I was preaching, I was like struggling, like there's more to this. I just can't seem to get it out. But I think it was because God wanted to pour this into me. And if I were to put it all together into one, we would have been here too long. The message was burning in my heart. I knew he wasn't finished. He took me to level two. The Lord took me on a deep dive of very extreme searching and digging into some places I didn't expect, places I've actually never gone in my studies before. A lot of work went into the study, and I hope I do it justice. I'm going to start out from what's seemingly a very strange place, telling a strange story. So if you would all turn with me to Genesis chapter 38. It shouldn't take you too long to get there. It's the first book in the Bible. Genesis chapter 38, it tells us the story of Judah, the eldest of the twelve tribes of Israel, Judah, and Tamar. I'm going to be reading the entire chapter, but I'm going to take it slow because I want us to really take in what's going on, the narrative. This is a very strange story. 
Some of you may, may know it, some of you may not be as familiar with it, but we're going to go through it together. <clears throat> and it came about at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adullamite, whose name was Hira. Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite woman, or a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into her. So let's stop there for just a moment. We see there that Judah had taken a wife from the Canaanites. Keep that in your mind. Verse 3, So she conceived and bore a son, and he named him Er, 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 E-R, I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> then she conceived again and bore a son, and named him Onan. She bore still another son, and named him Shelah, and it was Ahazib that she bore him. Now Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Er, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord. We don't know why Er was evil in the sight of the Lord, but he was evil in the sight of the Lord. And it says, so the Lord took his life. <clears throat> then Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. He was speaking about early Jewish law. Verse 9, Onan knew the offspring would not be his, so he went into his brother's wife and wasted his seed on the ground in order to not give offspring to his brother. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, so he took his life also. So now Judah's first two sons are dead. He only had one that remained. Verse 11 says, Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, I am afraid that he too may die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. Now after a considerable time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. So his Canaanite wife died. And when the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira the Adolamite. It was told to Tamar, Behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she removed her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in the gateway of Anam, which is in the road to Timnah. And she saw that Shelah had grown up she had not been given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, for he had, she had covered her face. So he turned aside to her by the road and said, Here now, let me come in to you. So Judah's picking up a prostitute on the side of the road. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What will you give me that you may come in to me? <clears throat> He said, therefore, I will send you a young goat from the flock. She said, moreover, will you give a pledge until you send it? In verse 18, he says, he said, what pledge shall I give you? And she said, your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. I'm going to stop there for just a second. As we know, there's different versions or translations of the Bible. Some of you may have seen the word seal instead of, instead of signet, and you may have seen the word bracelet instead of cord. If you had seal instead of signet, raise your hand. Stephen, what version was that? Amplified? Okay. And, and who had bracelet instead of cord? Several of you. I, wanted, I want you to know that that out in my deep dive, signet and cord are the correct words to use here. So I'm going to pit continue. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she arose and departed and removed her veil and put on her widow's garments. 
When Judah sent a young goat by his friend the Adolamite to receive the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. He asked the men of her place, saying, Where is the temple prostitute who was by the road at Enam? Now it's important to note here, this is, this is a Philistine city. This was a Philistine temple, not a Jewish temple. Not a Hebrew temple. Continuing in verse 21, But they said, There's been no temple prostitute here. So he returned to Judah and said, I did not find her. And furthermore, the men of the place said there had been no temple prostitute here. Then Judah said, let her keep them. His seal, or his signet, his cord, and his staff is what he's talking about. Let her keep them, otherwise we will become a laughingstock. After all, I sent this young goat, but you did not find her. Continuing in verse 24, now it was about three months later that Judah was informed, your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the harlot, and behold, she is also with child by harlotry. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. It was while she was being brought out that she sent her to her father-in-law saying, I am with child by the man to whom these things belong. And she said, please examine and see whose signet ring and cords and staff are these. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, inasmuch as I did not give her to my son Shelah, and he did not have relations with her again. The end of the chapter says, it came about at the time she was giving birth. Behold, there were twins in her womb. Moreover, it took place while she was giving birth. One put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. But it came about, he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out. And she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. So he was named Perez, which means breakthrough. Afterward, his brother came out, who, was the, who had the scarlet thread on his hand, and he was named Zerah, which means glowing dawn. That's a weird story. You got Judah, the eldest son, the leader of the tribe of Judah. You've got Tamar, his daughter-in-law. His first two sons die. And she plays the harlot, gets pregnant by him. And then gives birth to twins. Let's break it down. Again, I had to do a deep dive on this study and be patient while I work my way through this. <clears throat> These passages concern a very intriguing story of Tamar and Judah. Tamar married Judah's eldest son, Er. er how do you say that, Pastor? Yes. How do you say that? <laughs> I'm going to say Er because saying Er sounds weird. Tamar married Judah's eldest son, Er, who died before he could have a child. By Hebrew law, Er's kid brother Onan had to marry Tamar to provide a child to continue the family line and provide an heir who would receive a double share of inheritance. If Er died, which he did, then Tamar and Tamar remained childless, then Onan would get the inheritance as the oldest surviving son. So he thinks, I don't want to give her a kid, I want the inheritance. So he pretended to have relations with her, and when the moment came, he withdraws and his seed ends up on the ground. God deemed that act wicked, and Onan died prematurely. Now Judah... Rather than blame the premature deaths on his sons or their wickedness, according to the Talmud, he blames Tamar, saying she is cursed and therefore refuses to allow Shelah, his youngest son, to give Tamar a child because he didn't want Shelah to die. Since Shelah was just a kid at the time, he tells Tamar to wait until he is grown. But that was just a ploy because a couple years later, again, according to the Talmud, when Shelah is old enough to marry, Tamar reminds Judah of his promise and he responds, What promise? I never made you a promise. You're mad. 
You're just making that up. Forget you. So it goes back on his word. Judah's a real winner. So he refuses to allow Shelob to marry Tamar. And then by this time now, Judah is a widower. His Canaanite wife died. He wasn't really an old man. Obviously, he was still feeling frisky. Tamar is also not an old lady and still apparently attractive. One day, Judah decides he was going to Timnah to shear his sheep, if that's what his intentions were. Anyway, Timnah happens to be a Philistine city, the same place where Samson met the prostitute Delilah. Seems to be the place to go when you're looking for something like that. So, I just wonder if he really was going to shear his sheep. Why didn't he just do that at home? I don't know. Anyway, Tamar was pushed to the side and dismissed by Judah, not to mention his arrogance at thumbing his nose at Hebrew law, which as the eldest son he was sworn to enforce. She figured, I'm going to trick him. So she dressed herself up as a prostitute, and then sure enough, along comes Judah, trotting down the road. They negotiate a price, which happens to be a young goat. And again, I want to say, was he really shearing his sheep? If he's trotting down the road and his sheep aren't with him, what's going on there? Kind of strange. But a goat is actually a very high price. Because the going rate at that time for a prostitute was like two doves. Now we get to the part of the story which concerns what I'm really talking about. To make sure Judah does not welch on her, as Judah was not exactly carrying a goat in his pocket, she asked for some security or collateral. She wanted a pledge. And what she asked for is quite interesting. And the Midrash Rabbah even says that a prophetic anointing was kindled in her. I'm getting something. Nobody knew this was here. <laughs> and now it's stuck. She asked as collateral, first of all, his signet or his seal. Now, I don't have a signet or family ring. That's not really something we do these days. But I do have the ring that I always wear. And it's kind of fitting to use as a signet because it's a lion's head. I wear it as a reminder of my name, Daniel, referencing Daniel in the lion's den, but also... A reminder of the lion of the tribe of Judah. So in a way, it's kind of like my signet or my family ring. In Hebrew, this ring is a chathan. I'm going to put that back there so it's not in my face right now. The ring is a chathan. It's a signet, a ring the family seal is on. And it's usually hung by a leather strap around the neck of the eldest son of the family. Hey, I'm the eldest son of my family. I'm the only son of my family. (laughs) Chathan is often a word used to show marriage or family relationship. So there was a woman who was posing as a prostitute, was really Judah's daughter-in-law. According to the Talmud, she was an Israelite. She wasn't a Canaanite. She was an Israelite who was now seeking to carry on the family line with the child from Judah himself. And it's fitting that she asked for his chathan, or symbol of the family relationship, often used in marriage, before she had a sexual relationship. She wanted to keep it on the up and up and demanded his chathan, or marriage family ring. Technically, she was getting married to the guy, which the Talmud actually explains happened later on. Next, she asked for his cord. In Hebrew, this is a pathal. It's a cord. This was a leather string that held the family ring. They wore it around their neck. They didn't wear it on their finger. But it's no ordinary leather string. A pathal is an ornamental strap. It's intertwined 
with lace and silk and highly decorative. I made this last night. It's probably not as decorative as the ones they wore. But it does have leather, lace, and I couldn't find a silk ribbon, so this is a satin ribbon. It's the closest I could come. But such bathals or cords were later used by members of the Sanhedrin to indicate their status as members of the High Council. In other words, the bathal, the cord, symbolized law. And finally, she asked for his staff. I made this one a long time ago. Some of you might remember it. This again was no ordinary staff. It was a mate in the Hebrew. This was a rod that was a symbol or a badge of a leader or a ruler. It gave the ruler the authority to enforce the laws of the family. Even today, an officer of the law, an enforcer of the law, has to display a badge to signify his authority. Hence, this mate was Judah's badge, the token or sign of his authority to enforce Hebrew law. <clears throat> Tamar really pinned him against the wall on this by demanding that he give her a marriage or family ring, the symbolic cord that that ring symbolized the law of God, which demanded that as the wife of the deceased eldest son, she was entitled to a child. And finally, the meten, or staff, which symbolized the authority to enforce that law. She was a smart cookie. The Talmud goes even further to explain that the signet, or the chathan, was also the symbol of the royal line of the house of David. David which from the Messiah would descend. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Again, I'm happy I had that lion ring. <laughs> the quarter of Athal, as mentioned earlier, was a symbol of the Sanhedrin, the ultimate authority in explaining and fulfilling Hebrew law. And finally, the metet, or staff, is the symbol of the Messiah himself. Jesus was a direct descendant of the house of David, who fulfilled the law of God and was the Messiah. Oh, and one other thing. A result of this union with Judah, a son was born named Perez. He's the great, 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 however many greats, grandfather of Jesus. And we find in the Ethiopic version of the Torah, we find that Perez was actually the one who became king of Persia. I wonder if there's a tie there with the name. I didn't get that far in it, but Perez, Perezia, I don't know, similar. About 900 years later, wise men from Persia came to visit one of their king's great, 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 great grandchildren. So Merry Christmas, I guess. But I want to go back to that verse in Genesis 38, verse 18. And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet and thy cord and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it her and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. Now, if you're reading this in the context of the book of Genesis, you can't help notice how the narrative of Judah and Tamar is nestled between the narratives of Joseph's betrayal by his brothers. So Judah had actually just finished selling his brother into slavery. And then right after this, you find Joseph entering Egypt as a slave. So this happens right between the two, this, this chapter. This chapter is important, though, because it narrates the continuance of the tribe of Judah, the tribe which Christ would descend from. Due to the evil deeds by Tamar's first two husbands, Judah's first two sons, the Lord took their lives, leaving only one son. Judah's reluctance to give his last son in marriage to Tamar was actually a good thing, because without divine inter intervention, the line stemming from Judah would have been lost. Keep in mind that Judah's wife was Canaanite, and just as Abraham had, was instructed, or had instructed Isaac not to marry women of the Canaanites, in Genesis 28.1, only ten chapters earlier, the twelve tribes were to heed the same command. 
They weren't supposed to marry Canaanites. Although Judah's intent to fornicate with a Canaanite temple prostitute was sinful, God's sovereignty preserved the line of Judah from Canaanite infusion and kept it pure for the Messiah. The significance of these three objects in Judah's pledge, I think, rests in what all truly belongs to the true king of kings, the staff, the cord, and the signet, which also served as the seal of the family. How did I do with that? Y'all, y'all feel like you just sat through a lecture in a seminary class? <laughs> I'm not done. I want to look a little closer at these three objects because there's a lot more to see here. I wonder if that'll stay there. If it stopped swinging, it would. The cord. In many parts of Scripture, the cord is talked about in literal and physical reference. Oftentimes it's just talking about rope when you look at the word. But in the, in the root word, this cord, this pathal, is not mentioned very often. This verse from Genesis shows us that there's symbolism in this particular cord that was used to hold the signet. It was woven of leather, lace, and silk. Leather, lace, and silk. That's a three-strand cord. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Of course, we know the verse from Ecclesiastes 4.12. If one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him, and a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. That's interesting. This three-strand cord woven together around the neck and holding the family seal, the signet ring, this cord is special. It is symbolic and strong. It is the marriage of all the aspects of God and represents His sovereignty, His grace, and His fire. His law, His path to Him, and His love for us that He gives the gifts we talked about last Sunday. The cord represents God and all His attributes. The cord is law. God's law. The only way that man can be righteous before Jesus came. The law is perfect and just and righteous. It is simple yet complex. It is bound together upon itself in a way that you cannot just pick one part of it without the whole thing coming unraveled. Each strand of truth woven into the law of God that he gave to Moses is needed for man to be made clean before Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And we know that there is an enormous amount of prophetic overshadowing also woven into the law of God. It all matters. It's all important. It binds itself together one line after another, just like this Bethel. Now I'm going to talk about the staff a little bit. This is a big one. How long do we have? No, seriously, is there a time limit? We talked about Judah's staff and how foolishly he acted with it. But God's ways were higher than his. There was a plan in place. And then there's Moses' staff. The all-important staff with which he held while God performed many miracles. Dad, do you want to come preach Friday's message again? <laughs> For those that weren't here, he went over the life of Moses in great detail, talking about all the wonderful things that God did through Moses. And in all of that, there was a staff in his hand, a mateh. Turned it into a serpent. I'm not going to re-preach his message, but he turned it into a serpent, lifted it over the waters of Egypt and turned it to blood, lifted it to the sky and the plague of hail began, parting the waters, lifting it up for victory in battle, all with the mate in his hand. We see the importance of this. Even though Judah treated his with such disregard, even Aaron and Moses lifted with, with Moses lifted his staff over the waters and frogs came forth. And again, it was Aaron with his staff struck the ground and started the plague of flies. 
or gnats, depending on what version you're reading. They were even told to eat the Passover with their staffs in their hands. Staves were important. Then in number 17, each tribe's leader had to bring their staff and give them to Moses. He wrote their name on it and left it before the Lord in the tent of testimony. And when they came back the next day, Aaron's staff for the house of Levi had produced buds, marking his family as the priestly line. God used the staff in the Old Testament over and over and over. Why? Because it was just something handy that they carried with them? I don't know. You guys are going to like this one. I just threw this in here because I, I thought it was cool. Judges 5.14 says, From Ephraim, those whose root is in Amalek came down, following you, Benjamin, with your peoples. From Mahir, commanders came down. And from Zebulun, those who wield the staff of office. Then in Judges 6, an angel comes down, touched the meat and bread on the altar with his staff. So an angel carried the staff. And fire came up from the rock and consumed the sacrifice. And then the angel vanished. We know from 1 Samuel that David took his staff with him in his fight against Goliath. Because it says, he took his staff in his hand and selected five smooth stones. When you read, think about the battle between David and Goliath, you just sort of see him standing out there with his sling, but he had his staff with him. I'm sure as I'm going, some of you are thinking about this one, Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Each one of those Old Testament scriptures I'm talking about, if you go to the Hebrew, it's the metat, the staff. It's the same thing. I'm going to skip a few. There's just one in the New Testament that I want to pull out on this. Mark 6, 7, and 8. It says, He summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And he instructed them that they were to take nothing for their journey except a mere staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belt. This is Jesus sending his disciples out to cast out demons for basically the first time. And he says, don't take anything but your mate. Don't take anything but your staff. There's a lot of references in scripture on the subject of the staff. We look at it now and just see a mere stick. But it represented much more of them, much more to them. It was their personal authority, a part of their identity. The staff was also the shepherd's tool to herd the sheep. The staff represents Jesus, the great shepherd. So all throughout the Old Testament, when all of these miracles were happening, it was a symbol of Christ. Christ was with them. Christ was there when Moses parted the waters of the Red Sea. Christ was there. When the staff was left in the tent of the testimony and Aaron's rod budded, life sprang forth from a dead stick representing Christ. That's interesting. Life springing forth from something dead. That sounds like Christ's resurrection to me. So if the cord is God and the law, and the staff is Jesus and grace, that leaves one thing to be the signet. Are you with me? The signet. This is frustrating for me because I feel it in my spirit. But getting it into words is very difficult. The pattern is in Scripture, and it all boils down to this the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
There was law, there was Christ, and then there was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is our source of spiritual power and authority. Pastor talked about it on the first week of Friday Night Fire and Glory. He talked about being baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. What is that fire? The early church had it just out of the upper room and they were unstoppable. This is a very difficult subject to quantify and make it seem attainable to our human minds, but this goes beyond the mind. So stop thinking and start tuning in to the voice of the Spirit of God and be patient with me as I try in my humanity to get through this. I'm going to look at a few scriptures. I'm going to go sort of quick here. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 says, in him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. The pledge of our inheritance is the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 1.22 says, Who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. The Holy Spirit is a seal in our hearts, a pledge made to us by God Himself, the great I Am. Again, Genesis 38 Says He said, therefore, I'll send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, will you give me a pledge until you send the goat? And he said, what shall I give you as a pledge? And she said, your signet, your cord, and your staff that is in your hand. The seal was a signet ring worn around the neck. It was a pledge of marriage, even though dumb Judah didn't realize it. The Greek word for pledge is arhabon in the New Testament. The Hebrew equivalent in the Old Testament is arabon. Very similar, spelled slightly different. We know the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a sign to unbelievers. The word sign is translated from the Latin word signet, which refers to a signet ring. What was the purpose of a signet ring to seal a letter? It was so that you know... Who sent it to you? If you received a letter and it was sealed, they stamped it with their signet ring so you knew that the person who had that signet was the one that sent the letter. It was important. If you lost your signet ring, if you gave your signet ring to somebody, that's like ancient identity theft. This was your, this was your, your pass key. Also, a signet ring could be given to someone to act with authority over the one who gave it. This would have been a high honor to be given such a ring. It's like power of attorney. The Holy Spirit is our signet ring from God. It is His seal. It is His pledge to us. Holy Spirit is our engagement ring a pledge until our redemption day, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Are you getting this? Yeah. Revelation 22, 1 through 4 says, Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal. <coughs> Coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of it, its street, on either side of the river was a tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree for the, were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and His bond servants will serve Him. And verse 4 of Revelation 22 says, They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. His name on their foreheads is the seal, the signet, the sign of their being His, of our being His. The Greek word shragizo means to set seal upon or mark with a seal. Exodus 9.4, we see that the Lord wanted to make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt so that nothing would die of all that belonged to the sons of Israel. That distinction was made with a sign or a seal marked upon the livestock. 
And then in Romans 8.16, it says, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. That distinction is made with the sign or seal marked upon us. We even see in Revelation where the beast marks his people with 666, but God's people are marked with his name. I'm talking about authority, dominion, and kingdom. There's a higher level to this that I, I don't know if we really understand it. We, we say in Jesus' name all the time. We say it in warfare. We say it in prayers for healing. We say it in prayers over our family. We say it in prayers for safety for our travels and in blessings over our food. But what is it that that, that really means to say in Jesus' name? It really means an authority. We stand with the cord, the staff, and the seal of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We stand with those in our hands in the same place of authority. Kingdom authority. The word authority is exousia. It also means power. It's the same word. We talked about taking ownership of our power, gifts, and promises last week. We talked about the power of the Holy Spirit. But the kingdom authority of the Holy Spirit is really what it is. It's not just power. The dictionary defines authority as the power or right to give orders, to make decisions, and enforce obedience. Okay? And I found it interesting in the dictionary, it, it, it put it in quotes and wanted to use the word authority in a sentence. And this is the sentence that they chose to use in the dictionary. It says, he had absolute authority over his subordinates. I thought about that for a little while. When we take authority, there's a good catchphrase for us. We say it all the time, take authority over it. When we take authority we need to realize that the demonic forces of illness, fear, oppression, possession, and everything else are our subordinates. And we are just there to enforce obedience. That's what it means to take authority. The demons are our subordinates and we're there to enforce obedience. With our hathan, hathal, and matah. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the law, grace, and empowerment into kingdom authority through the Holy Spirit. When we are praying, commanding, or declaring in the name of Jesus, we are speaking not His name as a magic word, as I've said before. It's not a key phrase that unlocks the power. It's not the thing that we just have to say to make things be accomplished. We are speaking from a place of standing in His true authority. The authority of the kingdom of God. People long ago understood better than us what it means to do something in someone else's name. But let's look at it in a way we can wrap our modern heads around. Think back to when you were a child. Is there any only, only children here? I actually don't know the answer. Anybody an only child? Okay, then you'll all get this. Mom told me to tell you... <laughs> Mom told me to tell you... Or Dad told me to tell you... If your sibling came up to you and said, Mom told me to tell you that you need to be at the table in 10 minutes. Was it your brother or sister that told you that, or was it your mother that told you that? You took that as the word of your mother. Think about that. That's what it is when we do something in the name of Jesus. If we're acting in accordance with the will and the word of God by the prompting and the leading of the Holy Spirit, and we're facing off an attack or a sickness or a possessed person, it doesn't matter what it is. We're standing there and saying, God told me to tell you. Dad told me to tell you. That's authority. 
I'm just the messenger. I'm just the conduit. As a child, we understood what that meant. So when we stand in the face of a demonic attack, facing down a situation that needs a miracle, or even just praying for our safety and travel or a blessing over our food, we are speaking as though Christ himself were the one doing it. We are his ambassador in this world. Let's talk about the faith we have in that authority, though. The Bible talks about taking up a deadly serpent. It also talks about drinking poison. I'm not advocating we do that as a test of our faith. There's some crazy churches out there that do that kind of thing, and I think that that's absolute foolishness. But if you were in a situation and you were faced with imminent danger, an imminent threat, would you face it without fear? If there was a deadly serpent on the ground in front of you, could you face that without fear? If you found out that the food you just eaten had poison in it, could you face that without fear? Could you face it without fear because you know the authority of Jesus is in you? The disciples in the boat during the storm didn't get it. They saw the storm, the storm imminent danger, an imminent threat, and even though Jesus Christ himself was on board the boat with them, they freaked out, and they woke him up, and he scolded them for it because they lacked faith. They didn't get it. They didn't understand kingdom authority, and Jesus Christ was there with them in the boat. Peter, walking on the water, got it for a second. He understood it for for. I don't know how long he walked on the water. It doesn't say, but I, I imagine it wasn't too long. Do we get it? Do we get it? We can pray over our travel. You know, God be with me as I travel. Keep me safe. We can pray over our food. Lord, bless this food and, and let it be a nourishment to my body. And we pray those prayers in Jesus' name. And we pray them with a certain level of confidence. A certain level of confidence. But what about a demon-possessed person? What about somebody who's suffering from cancer? Or somebody afflicted with AIDS that's asking for healing? Do we really stand in the full authority of Jesus? Do we truly own it in ourselves at our very core? Is our food any more complicated to God than a cancer cell or a demon in someone? We say when we're speaking to a demon, I command you right now in the name of Jesus. Stop right there. What are you really saying? Is it just a catchphrase that we've learned? Is it just a catchphrase that we use, that we know that we're supposed to say it? We're supposed to do it that way. Or are you truly commanding with gut level knowledge and acceptance of the full kingdom backed authority of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? It's really easy as a Pentecostal, as a radical spirit filled believer, to get caught up in the phrasing of the evangelical church. The rhetoric that we hear. And I'm not calling it bad. I'm just saying it's easy to get accustomed to it. To get used to it. To get comfortable speaking it. So much so that we lose focus and grasp of what it is we're really doing. That we are operating as sealed agents of the king of the universe. The special forces of the Lord of hosts. We are facing the enemy and all he sees is the Jesus that is in us, the Holy Spirit that is flowing through us. We are Christians with a capital C. What are we embracing when we pray in the name of Jesus? Words or true authority? So what do we do with all this information? 
We have to accept it as a reality. Are you saved? Sanctified? Filled with the Holy Spirit? Then you are standing as an authorized agent, having official permission or approval of the kingdom of God. And you can act on his behalf in every situation. You have his pledge, his engagement ring, his signet, his seal. You have his cord and you have his staff. But hold on to them. You have to walk in obedience to his word. If you don't, you're not going to hold on to them. Again, we have to make that core level shift to realize that we are spiritual beings operating in a fleshly realm. And I talked about it last week. I'm going to hit that nail again. We have to make a core level shift and realize that we are spiritual beings operating in a fleshly realm, not the other way around. When we are faced with seemingly insurmountable odds, we need to stay in the spirit. The enemy wants you to act and react in the flesh. A quote from Leonard Ravenhell says, Everyone wants to be clothed with power, but no one wants to be stripped of self. And unfortunately, for us as humans, those two are mutually exclusive of one another. If we are clothed in flesh, we cannot be clothed in power. And to be clothed in power, we have to be stripped of self. Romans 8.19 says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. I sort of took something I read on Facebook and I, I plagiarized it a little bit, but it really fit with what I was doing, so I, I, I included it here. <clears throat> I changed some of the wording. The Lord is calling His people, the body of Christ, into levels of maturity and kingdom authority on a scale never seen before. It is a call to walk by faith. It is knowing His great love. It is trusting in Him, in what He says, and in particular, it is trusting the leading of His Holy Spirit, our signet ring, our engagement ring to Christ. This is a time of walking by faith and encountering great spiritual transition and inner transformation that results in the release of kingdom influence and authority. Simply believing in the tenets of the Christian religion while remaining spiritually stagnant will no longer be helpful. It's no wonder so many who believe in him are spiritually unfulfilled. For in Hebrews 6, chapter, one, chapter 6, verse 1 says, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all with unveiled faces, looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Keep that verse in mind until next Friday, right, Mom? We, his sons and daughters, are being elevated now towards maturity through the inward work of the Spirit that the sons of God be revealed in the earth. This will be done only by faith through his grace. We are on the move. Hold on for the journey of a lifetime. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith is from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. He is finding for himself a people who will buy into his vision, come into agreement with him, say what he says and do what he does to the glory of God the Father. I stand with his cord, his signet and his staff ready to do His will. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Will you stand with me? Who here feels like they get it? Like, really get it? I want to see hands. 
Great. Come into the altars. Like you understand the kingdom authority that you have. Like at your gut level, the core of who you are, in your spirit, you realize that you are standing with the full authority of the kingdom of God. You are a special agent for his kingdom. You have his signet ring, his promise, his seal to act on his behalf. You have his cord, the law of God that backs everything up. And you have his staff, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who died for your sins. Anyone who raised your hand, I want you to turn right now to the person next to you. And you're going to start taking authority over anything that is needed. Sickness, depression, anxiety, demonic attacks, temptation. I don't care what it is. Start taking kingdom authority over any need that your neighbor might have. Are you ready? Can we have some music real quick, Donna, before that? <laughs> My wife's prayer partner disappeared to the sound booth. We're going to take authority. Take authority. It's been given to you. You just have to take it. In Jesus' name. Lift up your voices. Pray for one another. Seek the will of God in their lives. Move in authority. Lives will be changed. Souls will be healed. People will be set free by the power and the authority of Jesus. By the power and the authority of the law of God. By the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. No longer will you be held back. No longer will you be stagnant. You will be set free right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I stand as his sealed agent and I declare in the name of Jesus that every one of these prayers that is being prayed right now will be met with an answer from the holy, 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 most high God. <laughs>